in connection to your sign tonight. Please stand by. Welcome back to another episode of the Science Night Podcast. My name is James, and with me, as always, is Steffi. Hi. And Jason. Hello. Tonight, we are jumping aboard the D-Hype train, talking about fusion fuel, singing a black hole song, and visiting a secret garden. In the second half, we have the triumphant return of those marvelous mollusks, the cone snails, because I am talking to the person that's trying to find out new ways to use their toxins, Bea Ramiro. But first, the news. If you've been reading the news recently, you may have noticed some science stories with headlines tailor-made to make you click them. Specifically, the hot new plague that's sweeping the world, monkeypox, and a pretty big asteroid that is passing by the Earth as you are listening to this. Unless you're listening to this after the Friday 527 release date, if that's the case, maybe you should subscribe on the podcatcher of your choice so you don't miss out the next time. Like, let's get it together here, people. But anyway... All these world-ending events have probably got you down, but we are here to tell you don't panic. Everything will remain as okay as it usually is, as far as these stories are concerned. And, I mean, let's be real, there are bigger issues that you should be thinking about, like the ongoing pandemic that is still totally happening whether you want it to or not, and like, you know, climate change, which won't be as dramatic as a comic strike, but will extinct us just the same. So what do we think about clickbait science articles? It's everywhere. It's a problem. Yeah. And it's tiring. Yes. I think it's especially gross with the monkeypox thing, because they're really just trying to click on the same emotions as as the they did with COVID, as the tried and true COVID method. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with you. It's just played out. We already have pandemic fatigue. It's alarming that there is an outbreak of monkeypox in places where it doesn't typically occur. And so it's something to keep an eye on, but it is such a treatable virus. It is um, not really an issue, right? So it's not something to be overly concerned with. And I think only 10% of people who get infected with monkeypox die. And so, yeah, that's still 10%. And I understand. But when we compare that to, you know, the early phases of the COVID pandemic, um, it's a, a drop in the bucket. We have a vaccine already. We have stores of the vaccine. Um, I think what's a little bit shocking to me, though, is that I think I read in the press this week that the U.S. has about a thousand doses, which, OK, well, a thousand doses is a lot for the size of a, a typical monkeypox outbreak. It's perfectly sized. But if it were to become something like COVID, which it's not going to be anything like COVID, at least that's not predicted to be that way at all, a thousand doses isn't really that much. And so it's just a frame of reference issue here, right? A scale, an issue of scale. And I think that issue of scale is the point here. It is not going to be like COVID because it is not going to have an outbreak. It's not as contagious uh, in the same ways that, that COVID is. And so, you know, it's not something to worry about. Yeah. I think we should also be good, good, good science communicators and talk about why specifically, well, why it's it's very different from COVID because it's not a novel virus. Like this is a known virus that has been infecting humans that we do have like a fully sequenced genome. We're not just like trying to build the ship as the flood is starting uh, like we were at the beginning of the COVID virus too. Because I, I think that's also an important thing to note. Like we have – we already have antivirals. We already know about how this virus affects the human body. We know how it spreads. We know how to combat it. Back in – March of 20, 2020, we were just like, mm -hmm. I don't know, just stay inside and tape your windows up. Uh, watch Tiger King. Here's Tiger King. Have you seen Tiger King yet? Watch it again. Right. <laughs> no, that's a, really, that's a really good point. Um, we know a lot more about this virus than we did about COVID to begin with. And so that's why we have a vaccine already. And that's why we're not you know, starting from scratch. So it's not as concerning. Um, the other issue is really that it spreads primarily through contact. Um, so, you know, skin to skin contact. 
and that is all it is. And so there are reports out there that, you know, this is something that is um, of concern right now to the LGBTQ community, but it's not associated with that kind of community. It's not associated with any community. Sure. It yeah. is yeah. just that's where it's occurring right now. And so, you know, some of these, you know, news items that are trying to malign entire swaths of the population for things. It's just, it's so tiresome. It happened it's with COVID. Irresponsible. Right. And it's, I'm just so tired of all of this as, you know, to your point, yeah. Steffi, it's exhausting. Well, and then it kind of brings about distrust in science because they're trying to make these sensational headlines to get people to click on it um, and make a big story out of what's really not that much there. And so then people just get like us, tired of it, and you just kind of ignore it. And then suddenly there are issues, and you already have this distrust that you have to overcome. Right. And it's not limited to science. That's the problem. Yeah. You know, these sensationalist headlines are everywhere for every kind of news item. And at what point does the American populace lose confidence in all the institutions? That's the thing that we need to be the most concerned about. Right. I think we should point out, though, like, the headlines coming from government agencies are basically what we're saying. Like it's it's okay. Yeah. We're watching it. We we know how to we know how to go about this. Don't worry. We're letting you know this is happening so that you know what's happening. We're being very transparent. And then like I'm not even going to mention the news sources cuz I don't want to have my my vocal cords associated with them so you can you can pull this clip out and use it to besperch me when i when i rise to power and fame <laughs> um <laughs> but yeah um and i think obviously to your point like people are losing faith in journalism pretty quickly too when we have stuff like that just floating around not yeah. a good thing no it's not a good thing at all not a good thing at all yeah and then the asteroid Pretty straightforward. Asteroids come by all the time. Every time an asteroid comes by, we talk about it. We were all secretly hoping for a deep impact or a, an Independence Day. Um, as far as I know, Bruce Willis has not been deployed to this particular asteroid. Uh, Steven Tyler is not currently writing a ballad to go along with that trip. Um, so those are the really the warning signs you want to look out for. If Bruce Willis is at a launch facility or Steven Tyler like is back in the lab, <laughs> then maybe maybe worry. So it was called okay Armageddon, right? Armageddon. Wasn't that what it was called? Armageddon and Deep Bang Bang. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's talk about yeah. let's talk about how they basically the same movie came out within a couple of weeks of Right, right, right. It was and they were both like <laughs> they were both terrible. You know, well, but also I, I saw them both that's... and loved them. Do you know what I mean? Right. I am easily yeah. entertained. Oh, for sure. Yeah. That was a summer. I mean, that was a summer of, of, you know, big time movies. It was big time action movies. It makes total sense that you would get a bunch of, of, uh, drilling specialists trained up to go into space rather than teaching astronauts how to work a, you know, big DeWalt. Uh, totally makes sense. Tracks. I mean, that, I mean it kind of. Uh, they are. It, it does, actually. I, yeah. Scientists oh, can't it? do everything. There's a lot right. more skilled people out there. Also, it seems like it's the SpaceX model, right? I mean, I guess the difference is they weren't trying to leverage Bruce Willis to buy Twitter. Um, <laughs> so perhaps they won't have as deep an impact as they had hoped. Let's move on. Let's let's park the dehype train cuz one of us has some explaining to do. Oh no. Steffi? Oh, I was going to say Jason. Okay. How? <laughs> you don't want me to explain this. Yeah. <laughs> how dare you? I have been spending months talking about how great fusion is and how it's going to change the world and blah, 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 blah. And then I read this Wired article about how it's not, in fact, going to herald in the Jetsons-like future I've been promised because Eater's eating up all the dang tritium. I'm starting to wonder, did you even go to the White House to talk <gasps> about fusion or was that like Joseph Robinette Biden's rumpus room in oh, no. Delaware? <laughs> <laughs> so... I need you to explain yourself. Okay. <laughs> Let's start with the title. The title of this, okay? Nuclear fusion is already facing a fuel crisis. It doesn't even work yet, but nuclear fusion has encountered a shortage of, shortage of tritium, 
the key fuel source for most prominent experimental reactors. Fusion works. Like, we're here because of fusion. The sun <laughs> is fusion. Okay, so I'm sorry. Wow. Let's clarify I that. that. It's like <laughs> straight to the heart of it right there. I know. Yeah. That's right. Um, okay. So, yes. Leading – and let's just – I'm just going to give you like a concept overview, right? So the leading fusion concept, we've talked about it before. You can listen to the previous episodes. We use magnets to confine the super hot fuel to get these particles to stick together, and then they release a lot of energy when they fuse together. Okay. Um, Leading fuel that we use concept is deuterium and tritium. These are both heavier forms of hydrogen. Chemically the same as hydrogen, they just are a little bit heavier. And the reason why we use deuterium and tritium is because we can stick get them, heat them up to 100 million degrees to fuse together, and that's the lowest temperature for different fuels for getting them to fuse together. So that's why it's the leading. It's less heat needed, relatively. Okay. That being said, yes, tritium is one of the components for fusion. It is a short half-life, which means it'll decay away. So there's a limited time that you can actually use it. Most of its tritium is not naturally around. Uh, most of it comes from fission reactors. They're called can-do reactors. And that's kind of where we get our tritium. How do you spell can-do? Is it like, you know, hey, can-do, sir? Oh, it is like um, capital – It's a, it's an acronym – C A N D U. Um, Do you know what it stands no. for? Oh, man. Yeah, Canada awesome. Deuterium Uranium. Awesome. So it's, it's, of course, it's Canada. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Canada can do. Can do. Yeah. Nice. Right? <laughs> yeah. It seems okay. like it. I mean, it seems very British. Yeah. But right. uh, so maybe that's where it comes from. Uh, uh, yeah. So <laughs> what is the <laughs> no? It's Canada. Um, so one of the products you can get is, is tritium from this. So, oh gosh. Okay. So what you're saying is this Wired article should have taken a can-do attitude towards fusion. Exactly. You know, this Wired article got a little bit of information correct. At least there's that, right? It did talk about the short half-life. Yeah. You know, 12, it kept hammering home 12.3 years. Is that, was that accurate? Yeah. That's the half-life of tritium. Okay. So there we go. We got some information. Yeah. So yeah. basically, they spelled fusion correctly. They did. So basically, I mean, we know there's a limited supply, right? In this article, they talk about well, Eater is going to use it all up, and then there'll be nothing for the machine after Eater. It doesn't acknowledge the recent advances in our field, which is speeding up the timeline, coming up with faster built devices that actually use tritium at a sooner pace than Eater. So you don't have to worry so much about that. As a field, we acknowledge this is something we need to be concerned about, right? The tritium um, supply. So it's not shocking. It's well known. There's people that are researching how do you solve this issue. What maybe doesn't get conveyed in a lot of the articles too is we're working on methods to breed tritium in our fusion power plants. So you can put material around your machine That'll actually absorb one of the byproducts of fusion is a neutron. You have lithium that'll absorb that neutron. And one of the byproducts of that reaction is actually tritium. So what we're working on is kind of closing the fuel cycle by coming up with materials that have lithium in them that'll suck up that neutron and make more tritium. We take it out of there and then you put it back into your fusion power plant for fuel. So you, so part of the cycle of fusion power plants will actually be making their own source of tritium. So while we all talk about deuterium and tritium is the fuel for uh, a fusion power plant, the consumables are actually going to be deuterium and lithium. If you're looking for lithium, have you tried uh, 90s grunge music? There's a lot of lithium yeah. there. <laughs> they do have a lot of lithium. I would, yeah. uh, you know, pitch that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just like yeah. the Seattle wastewater supply from 1996. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah so, mostly lithium. <laughs> mostly. So we, we got that. Um, but yeah, this is a well-known 
um, concern in our field. And so kind of building off recent events is going more, uh, focusing more on the fusion technology that we need to tackle to close that gap, that technology gap. How do we pick the best material to breed tritium? How do we make sure we have all the subsystems to then extract tritium, put it back in the reactor, and then reprocess it, essentially? People are starting to work on that in a bigger effort. Uh, The other thing is, I can pass along this BBC article about the UK energy strategy. They're going to be, they're planning on eight new nuclear reactors to boost production of tritium. And so that under their new plan, they are looking at deploying these eight new nuclear reactors that can actually help with the tritium supply as well. So there's a lot of, there's a community of people working on it. And so I wish articles when they, they want to, they know fusion is in the news, right? And they want to make something controversy, right? So they find people that are against it, but they don't kind of portray the whole picture. Yeah. So this is sort of a call to other fusion researchers, but not just fusion researchers, scientists in general, to get out ahead of these kinds of news cycles. If you're working on something that is critical to the survival of our species, and a lot of people are, get out there and talk about your work. Um, Come on to Science Night. Come talk to us. Yeah. Definitely that. Uh, Step one, come on to Science Night. Step two is like the world-saving thing. Yeah, get out there, talk to people, and then also it's a call to journalists too, I know. Mm-hmm. You get clicks for contrary reporting and things like that, but yeah, I, I like to empower people to learn more about science and, and to find these sources, and it makes it difficult, right, when you have headlines like this and articles like this that don't have the big picture. It's a concern, yeah, and we're we're working on it. We need more resources to do it, but it's definitely something that's on our radar. Yeah. I want to quickly attack the subheadline that, like, I think is probably the most dangerous part of the entire article where it says it doesn't even work yet. Yeah. But if, if they would have listened to the Festival of Fusion 2021, <laughs> they would have heard you and Dr. Arturo Dominguez say, like, it wasn't designed to work. And I'm using scare quotes as an audio only thing, so I got to say that. Yeah. Uh, and I think by work, they mean, like, produce energy that you can plug into the grid. Um, that is a but yeah. great point. Yeah, they've all been science experiments on kind of figuring out different details. They're never designed to yet to produce more power out than you put in. I mean, half of our electrical grid doesn't work either, but <gasps> it works. Especially the part that's in Texas. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's beside the point. It's it's almost like the Wired editorial department doesn't listen to our podcast, and I take that as a personal attack. It's like we're screaming into the void. It's like we're just like yelling at a black hole. On this show, we talk a lot about the horrors of space, and I'm here to apologize because we should be taking a more positive and whimsical approach to our communication about space and all the cool things that's happening. So let's boldly and happily move forward to our next story. NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory was recently able to translate some of the data gathered from the black hole in the center of the Perseus Galaxy Cluster and turn it into a sound called a sonification. Here's a few seconds of that in no way disturbing or horrifying sound. And we can only play that much of it because I'm sure if we play the entire 35 seconds, it will summon the deep ones and lead to the undoing of our planet. But in a a fun way. So let's talk about this uh, this sonification process because, like, the sound is interesting, but I think the bil- that we're able to actually, like, do this is pretty interesting, too. I just love the sound. Yeah, it's yeah, awesome. It's crazy. It sounds like uh, the month of May in Indianapolis. It does. <laughs> I'm serious. You know, we've got the 500 coming up this weekend. Um, people in this state are crazy <laughs> for their racing. And when you drive by the speedway any day during May when they're running practice laps, this is what it sounds like. It is awesome. But this is coming from a lot further away than the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Yeah. 
just imagine like a slowly building Gregorian chant going on top of this, like unsettling. It's mm-hmm. it's pretty fascinating. So what the scientists did is that you, you can take measurements from space and the frequency of these measurements were actually, they existed outside of the range of the human ear. So then what they did was they resynthesized the signals by scaling them upward from their true pitch. So you could actually hear it with your ear. And, and so that's what you're hearing is, and they called it, they referred it to it as magnetic groaning created by the supermassive black hole and in its surrounding yeah. environments. Um, and it's fascinating. I am super interested to see what other sounds they can find in space because you always think of space is like this real quiet thing ridley scott told us that in space no one can hear you scream and maybe that's not the case at all this the company that produced these called system sounds is awesome they have a collaboration on their website uh that they did with nasa back in march where they took the sort of announcement of the 5000th exoplanet and then took the timeline of that discovery sonificated that and it's awesome it is absolutely beautiful and i think we should play a clip of it right here see how that's a lot more cheerful and not like summoning cthulhu um no, no, no journey into madness needed. Yeah, it's it's actually something that I could imagine. You know, we could do the Science Night logo in the sonification, right? So, so there's also a video that they have produced about how to sonificate any data set. Yeah, and so what we need to do is perhaps sonificate our uh, distribution of um, tweets. Who follow us? Mm, sure, yeah. Get some three D coordinate data where they Maybe are. We could turn it into an NFT. Yes, <laughs> I like it. I like yeah. it. I like it. I value this at eleven billion dollars. So when you played that sound clip early on about the black hole sonification, that's what caused our next news story. Oh my goodness. I bet we just created a hundred meter deep sinkhole in China. Let's go. Let's go live on the ground reporting. (laughs) James, James, can you hear me? I'm a hundred feet, a hundred meters down in a sinkhole. I didn't read this article. (laughs) Oh, this Ah. article is awesome. (laughs) (laughs) So let me set the stage for you, Steffi. We've all dreamed of stepping into a new hidden world and setting off on a journey of discovery and probably sleigh stacks. And that kind of happened to a team sent to explore a sinkhole in China's Guangzhou Autonomous Region, minus the sleigh stacks, for now. A hundred meters down, they found a preserved ancient forest full of plants and insects that were thought to have gone extinct. And it's still pretty early days as far as this is concerned, but researchers have not dismissed the possibility of discovering new other species, causing cryptid lovers like myself to wait patiently for new Yeti sightings. (laughs) So... What do we think about this journey into a secret Chinese garden? Wait, they're alive? All the things are alive? Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like it's a real it's a real uh lost world. It is. But without what? velociraptors as far as we know. It's amazing. So this part of China actually um is characterized by a specific type of topography called a karst, which is um an area of land that's sort of made up of limestone or dolomite or gypsum. And it's characterized by sort of underground drainage systems that develop sinkholes and caves. Um, And that happens because the rock that is forming these features is soft, and so it dissolves in water. And as the rainwater seeps into the rock, it slowly erodes. And so these kinds of landscapes can be worn away from the top or dissolved from a weak point inside the rock. And what's happening is these giant sinkholes are developing, and the land just sort of caves in on itself. But when it happened, a whole... You know, a whole long time back in history, the species that were around are still there. 
And so there are about 30 of these, I think, that have been found um, in this region of China. And this one is in the news right now, but there was one that was found in September um, in another part that that they actually went through and found um, species of plants that hadn't been seen in China since the late 1890s. Wow. Living. And uh, in particular, there was one plant that I saw, and I, can't, I wish that I could remember what it was, but what was unique about it is that there was a a leaf for this plant that the fruit developed on the leaf. It's very rare that you have fruit developing on leaves. And so it's a very, I think it's a very primitive kind of uh, adaptation, um, right? It's something that, that you don't see around a lot yeah. anymore. It's early on in plant history, prehistory. And so uh, they found several of those. It's fascinating what they can find down there. And they're ancient old growth forests. I mean, these are not these are not the kinds of forests that are developing after, you know, the land has been crosscut um, and developed into farmland or, you know, thinned out by logging. This is old growth forest and it's just awesome. And I was expecting to be like, okay, ancient forest in a sinkhole. They're obviously overblowing this. We're going to talk about like, I don't know, mushrooms and grass or something, mm -hmm. but 40 meter tall trees. <gasps> right. Like dense, wow. dense uh, um, ferns, like dense ancient ferns, that's animals, a, animals. Sure. I mean, that's a thing. That Lots of magical. insects and and vertebrate animals too. I mean, it's not just yeah. invertebrates, right? And it's so thick that it's like who knows what is available, and that's why I'm sure that yetis are going to be involved, probably, um, in either the creation or or ongoing stewardship of of these areas. Does that mean we're the clickbait um, now? If only. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're saying there's yetis down there. There better be yetis. I mean, we'd. I'd love. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, all I'm saying is they've been looking for a long time and they ha haven't found it yet. T. So, like I said, this secret garden story is still developing. If anything cool comes of it, we will keep you posted because here at the Science Night Podcast, we are really good at following up on stories that we are we think are especially amazing. And when you come back, we are talking about cone snails and the people that study them with Bea Ramiro from the Safavi Lab at the University of Copenhagen. But first, a message from another podcast that I think you will enjoy. Nature, we're part of it. Animals, we're one of them. What can we learn from other species? How can our lives be better by reconnecting with nature? And why does it matter at all? That's what Wild Connection, the podcast, is all about. Every week, we bring you authors, filmmakers, scientists, and conservationists whose work is revealing why being connected to nature and wildlife matters. You can find us where you get your podcasts, including iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify. We're hosted by Podbean, so you can find us there, too. And you can keep up with us on Twitter at Wild Connect Pod. Welcome back to the Science Night Podcast. Tonight, I am so excited to talk with our next guest. She is a graduate student in the Department of Biomedical Sciences at the University of Copenhagen, and she is now our resident cone snail expert. Please welcome to the podcast, Bea Ramiro. Hi, thank you for inviting me here. Oh, thank you so much for coming. You know, eagle-eared listeners will remember from a few weeks, well, quite a few weeks ago at this point, that we talked about kind of the coolest thing that we could have found at that time, these venomous sea snails. And boy, did we have a lot of fun with that. But we also, in that discussion, thought we're not really talking about this really cool project with a lot of depth. So we thought, you know, we should have the person that knows about this come on and talk about her work because it's super interesting and she's super interesting. So we did that. And she said yes. So let's get right into it. Bea, I'm going to ask you the first question, this hard hitting interview. Tell us a little bit about what you do. Yeah, I still work with cone snails and currently working with a specific group of compounds or peptides from the cone snails and looking at their 
activity at receptor. So that's what I'm currently doing right now. So we've moved out of the field and we're more into the lab. Is that correct? Yes. And tell me a little bit about what you hope to find with these, uh, p- this particular peptide group in this, uh, in the cone snail venom. Yeah. So for this one, we're looking at somatostatin like peptides. So somatostatin is a human hormone. It's mostly an inhibitory hormone. It inhibits other hormones and the cone snails have it. <laughs> so we're looking more into these things and how they can be like selective to certain types. So for somatostatin receptors, there are like five. And so the cone snails are like picking just certain receptors to target, so, which is pretty cool. And is this something that is unique to this species of cone snails that you've been looking at? Or is it something that is common to this, this uh, genus? I think from what we've like looked at, the data that we have, um, for this specific group of peptides, they are in this family or clade. There's a lot of them there, but there's also some, like it's not wholly like widespread, but mm-hmm, they're mm-hmm. just in some species. But yeah, but I think we just have to look into it more. There might, it might be hidden. In reading the popular reporting of your article and how there are so many different strategies for hunting, it really seems like cone snail venom is tailored to the strategy um, rather than being this uniform thing across across the group. Does that sound accurate? Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Like how they like how the the different predation strategies. You can also use that as a guide to look for these things, like what we're looking at. So we're specifically looking at the slow hunters, for example, in this case. And what is the benefit of the slow acting venom? The slow hunters, I should say. If well, I was a better I, science communicator, I would remember the actual strategy name that they said. I think I think I gave it something something weird <laughs> as a name, but it's uh for I guess we should go back. We should be good science communicators and go back. Uh this the slow hunting cone snail kind of um ambushes and is it ambush and assess? Did I do yeah. it? I've done it. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. I feel so great right now. This is, this is the highlight of my day. Um <laughs> So they ambush their prey and then they just kind of hang out and wait. And then that prey dies, spoilers, uh, and falls to the seafloor and then they eat it. So I look at that and I think that's a real cool way to kill a fish if I was a snail. But you look at that and you think, I bet we could fix something in humans with this. So so what is it that you're looking to do with with this venom potentially? Yeah, so I, so I think the when... The other graduate students look at it when it was in the lab. Um, I was also working on this venom, so it wasn't really like straightforward. Um, I was looking at this venom at that point. I didn't know that it was uh, like an ambush or assess or it was doing mm. the slow hunting predation strategy. But I did notice I was screening the venom for any potential bioactivity. And a lot of the ones earlier published are those that, I mean, if you guys see the video of the ones that are, um, that strike and immediately, so the taser and tether hunters, which like strike and immediately like, okay, the fish is gobbled up. <laughs> so I had this interesting activity that I found in mice, um, which somewhat mimics what we saw in the video with the fish. So the mice is pretty much normal the first hour or so, and then suddenly it becomes unresponsive. And I've never seen it before because normally you'd see a quick effect when you, once you inject them in mice, the venom, or at least the venom components. So I was talking to Dr. Oliveira, so one of the supervisors, and then it's like, oh, this quite matches actually with what we saw in the tank with the related uh, species of cone snail. So I think that's how it started. Um, so it's now opening up a new group of targets, which is not, so much studied, I think, with in terms of cone snail peptides. This is all really interesting, and I am well past my depth of biomed- biomolecular, even biomedical knowledge at this point. Um, so I will tell the listener to go and read all of the popular reporting on this article because it's really interesting. I want to pivot using my good my good interview voice. I want to pivot to a different story because you know. Not a lot of people at age three 
want to answer the question of what do you want to do when you grow up and say, I want to actually, maybe, maybe a lot of people do say, I want to work with cone snail venom, but, <laughs> but, uh, you know, by bi- biomedical biomolecular sciences that, uh, that seems like there has to be something that got you to this point, to the work you're doing with. So why don't you talk about that? Um, what is the thing that got you interested in the work and the science that you're doing today? Yeah, I think it really started when we were kids. And with my cousins, we are into science and we used to play with all this plants by my grandma's garden. Um I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the bougainvillea. It's a thorny plant. Um, it has a colorful leaves. And we used to um, make like fake blood out of it. So by like adding water and like crushing the leaves and adding water to it. Um, so I think that was like the interest of like finding what, like, for example, what causes, why is it color? Why is it like pink? Why is that? Um, we thought it was a flower, but it's actually like a colored leaf. And when I got into university, I took up like chemistry and I went, and did my thesis on um, natural products chemistry. So mostly looking at plants. So in the Philippines, we, I think also some other places in the world, there's a lot of like use of medicinal plants. And so Mm -hmm. I was interested in, so what causes them or like, why do people use these plants for medicine? And that's how it started. It was initially with plants, but then I heard a talk on cone snails. And then that sounded so cool much more cooler um first i saw the hunting videos and like okay this is amazing um and then i didn't know you can also study a similar like natural products type of study but in animals this time so that was how i got it into it it's pretty amazing how tone cone snails can can tether all of us just by learning more about them <laughs> So you, you know, you got interested in these kind of natural product studies and that's what brought you to, and and just the natural gravity of cone snails drew you to them. I want to talk about the project itself. So you, there's some great pictures of you and some of the popular reporting of you sitting out of the boat and pulling up something. (laughs) And all of those articles were really focused on the story of these cone snails potentially having these therapeutic effects and maybe eliminating some of the more dangerous uh, pain painkillers for use in humans. And they did talk about like you had, they had to be gotten and brought to the lab and there wasn't much more talk about that. And every graduate student that's ever done field work, all of the good stories are about the trials and tribulations of getting their, subject to the point from when they're just like out and about in the wild and to the point where that subject is turned into some kind of data set but that never gets covered <laughs> in anything so i want to i want you to talk about the project of of getting these dang snails out of the ocean <laughs> I, I totally agree with you like field works like the best time <laughs> even if it's somewhat stressful i guess um because you do have to prepare a lot before going even um so like first we do get permits and so that's also one challenge at least for us it takes a while and um, you do have to go to the community and not just you know and talk to them um so that's one getting permits and then also we rely on the expertise of the fishermen actually on like locating them and having their their techniques and you know what i was pulling it's actually a net but those are like their technology um and then we just rely on them uh, and then I think in terms of like the preparation, so our field site is actually in central Philippines and the university that I studied and worked in is in the capital city. So it takes an hour flight. So we do have to travel and then bring everything, um, especially because so a lot of the materials is in the capital city, but when you go to the provinces, it's not, you know, you don't have a lot of, Yet, fortunately, um, we work in the next, like a bigger city down south um, in the Philippines. So, for example, we need liquid nitrogen. <laughs> and like, this is hard to like find. Uh, we, we found like a, a place to get it in Cebu, the collection site. So that is nice. But actually, the like one story would be, how do we transport a liquid nitrogen tank from Manila to Cebu? And every time the check-in counter people are like, what 
is this thing? <laughs> um, I think we should like get um, you know miles for our our tank because we never remove the stickers because it makes the people at the check-in counter more comfortable or at ease. That okay, this has traveled. It's been through security a lot. Mm-hmm, it mm-hmm. it's it has traveled probably more than us, um, just back and forth to different travel uh, you know collection sites and also taking the samples back to Manila. It's also a challenge. Is there any kind of considerations you have to make with the change in depth to these snails? You know, I know if you would do that to a human, there would be some considerations that you would have to do. Is there is do the are the snails more resilient? Is there something I'm obvious I don't know about mollusks right here? <laughs> no, 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 that's actually a, a valid point. I think one or like two major differences would be temperature and pressure. With pressure, it's kind of hard to control. <laughs> But temperature, we can. So actually, the for example, this specific snails that we get, the one that is featured in the study, um, so they are the deep water ones. So we do put like an extra container and then mm. outside the container, it has like ice because it's warm in the Philippines and you don't. So at least they'll be a little bit comfortable and will survive at least to before we dissect them. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Sure. I guess this poses the uh, the question that would be obvious to someone who does this work, but so not obvious to somebody like me who doesn't. Is there a reason that they have to stay alive as long as possible? Is there a degrading of the uh, biomedical compounds at the time of death. Yeah, you actually got it, right? (laughs) Boom, Uh, did it. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, we don't want the proteins or the peptides that are in the venom to degrade. So we want them at, you know, the best state they are, especially because when we analyze them, and that's also why we need the liquid nitrogen. So we flash freeze them Mm -hmm. after dissection. So we Mm -hmm. we maintain, um, so we we will be able to get, you know, as close as what they use in the... Um, in their natural environment when we study them. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. You also talked about how you're doing this work in the Philippines. Are you doing this work? So was the, was this project uh, when you were part of the university of Copenhagen or were you at a different institution at this point? It took a long time. So it started (laughs) when I was still in the Philippines. So it started when I was still working um, in the Philippines and studying there. So part of it is actually part of my studies back home in the Philippines. Um, and then we finished a few of the like molecular pharmacology stuff um, mm-hmm. here in Copenhagen. It's really interesting because it seems like this project is kind of growing with you as you progress through your, your academic training, right? Um, this is becoming much more targeted as, as you're now a graduate student, you're looking at these specific things. Why don't we just talk about how work and life change as you kind of progress up that thing and you move to different universities with different abilities to do this work. Are there changes in the work that you're able to do now than when you were in the Philippines? And how has that changed this project along the way? There are definitely changes. Uh, I, I, but I learned a lot of the venom isolation and and then the collection part, like sorting all these snails in the Philippines and maybe hopefully discovering new species. It's also fun to do like the field work. And then the isolation um, of the venom components in the Philippines, we can do that. Um, and I, I also actually got trained in the U.S. to do a few of the techniques and assays. So that so the go- normally the goal is that we get trained somewhere else and then we bring home the technology to the mm-hmm. Philippines and then we can set it up. And we did that for a few times. And so I learned some of the assays uh, in like to test the, the venom components, I learned it somewhere like in the mm-hmm. U.S. Um, and then brought it back home and trained also my other colleagues there. I was privileged that I was also in that training in, in Utah and we were also able to work to make like protein crystals for, for this peptide also. So I learned that technique there. Mm-hmm. And then coming here to Copenhagen, uh, learning th- Totally different uh, techniques as well for the molecular pharmacology side of things. 
I guess what are some of your goals? So you're you're still a graduate student and you're still working on this project. What are some of your goals for the future? You talked about the idea of of going out, getting this training, bringing things back to the Philippines. Do you do you see yourself going back to the Philippines when you're done with your work in Denmark? Do you see yourself doing something else, or do you you didn't really you're you're not really looking at that part yet. You're still looking down the microscope. <laughs> <laughs> I would really like to go home, but I also haven't like looked far ahead yet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, but it's always nice to just like get to work with people back home as well and teach as much as whatever we've learned. Mm-hmm. Um, Let's talk about kind of the end of the cone snail question, at least the peptide group that you're working with. So This is like a really far down the road thing, and maybe it's just a thought experiment at this point. So if this works out and we're able to utilize this particular natural product for therapeutic use, I could see there being like a run on cone snails at that point. Is there an ability to synthesize this peptide without snails or all of a sudden is cone snail fishing going to be like the next gold rush yeah so this uh the like a lot of the studies we've done in the paper actually are already on the synthetic uh version of the of the peptide so Mm. the so i think it's really important to learn the characterization part so like once we get it from the field and then find out that it's something interesting we figure out what it is and then you don't have to like get all the stuff yeah, they can right. enjoy <laughs> um, but then you can get to study them and I think now too with the new techniques so I started working on this like super long time ago that we would need a lot of material to start working on a certain species but now with like newer techniques you can do like mass spectrometry just by mm-hmm. looking at one venom duck from a cone snail like one species so that's nice. I think that you don't have to struggle and get. To- yeah. yeah. And the cone snails can enjoy a future in the depths, uh, able to ambush and assess to their heart's content without yeah. having a thousand prospectors looking for the new pharmaceutical thing. Uh, I guess that I guess that's a good button on this project. So we we don't have to worry about the. Uh, degrading of cone snail populations due to this so that's that's a good thing one of the things i want to kind of finish on because we're getting we're getting to the end of the time that you've given me because you're you're a very busy person and there's a very large time difference in in (laughs) how we're talking to now and i want to talk about that time difference so you grew up in a much warmer climate than you're currently in uh you're you're in denmark right now uh, what was that change like, uh, you know, moving from somewhere where you're able to dive down and get cone snails or at least sit on a nice boat and reel up the cone snail net to an area that is not quite like that? Was there was there a big change or have you been able to kind of navigate that pretty easily? It was a pretty big change. And I when I first arrived here in Denmark, it was November. So it's like getting to winter. The sun sets at 3 p.m. or something like that. It really threw me off um, because back home in the Philippines, it's like 6 a.m. sunrise, 6 p.m. Mm-hmm. sunset, and that's it. And then maybe it changes like 30 minutes or so if it's like December, January, and then goes back to a, a little bit later. But it doesn't change that much. So that was kind of different. It rains a lot here. I mean, it rains a lot in the Philippines, but it's like, I don't know, different. I think it's just like gray skies. It's and... a different kind of rain. I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. But I think it's also nice that the rain doesn't, uh, it's like you can go out without that umbrella. It's not too mm. strong because we have like torrential rains in the Philippines. Like, Yeah. You know, I, I, I never lived that close to the equator but i lived in in florida for a while and i also live in vermont now anyone that's not familiar with the united states that's the very very south and close to the very very north i i like to live in the extremes i guess uh and i live up in the mountains now so when we get rain here it is like a mist and it's just kind of gray for three days in a row but it's also very cold for those three days and when i lived in a subtropical area you would get torrential downpours for like an hour and a half 
and then it would be super sunny and hazy and steamy and you would get those really cool you know those really cool Borgen Bougainville uh, uh, plants where you can see different colors and not just like a uniform malaise for six months of the year <laughs> so yeah, I think you're underselling it. So because you're living in it right now. Uh. <laughs> now it's it's gonna it's like longer days. That's also really something new to me. Like it's close to midnight, but it's still mm. bright. Sure, so that's, that's pretty fun also to experience. Like okay, um, it never yeah. gets dark. You do a lot of work in the lab, but there's got to be other things that you do to kind of occupy their t- your time. Uh, what are the things that you do? as hobbies to kind of like de-stress and pull yourself away from your work. Cause I think that's important for everyone to, to talk about as well. Yeah. I like to take photos actually. So I, I travel into photography. So I go around and take photos, but I also like to hang out with kids actually. So I volunteer as a, like a teacher for preschoolers. Like I love that age. I just love little young kids and they um, play with them and do crafts. That's mostly on weekends. <laughs> yeah, you don't you don't uh, you don't break out the cone snail venom with the preschoolers. They they kind of frown <laughs> upon that. So actually, the nice thing there's like a new postdoc in our group. She she's also like into outreach and education. So the nice thing is she set up um, like a lesson. So we get to go around schools and teach about cone snails because it's also something new for people here in Denmark. Mm. They're like, what is this thing? Um, so to introduce, just share this cone snail information around Denmark, but it is in Danish. She is Danish, so she. Mm. I just hang, I uh, just like go with her and help her with it. I guess this is an interesting topic too. So are you able to teach the like the little kids of Denmark a little bit about the Philippines and, and your home by introducing the cone snails and having it be an opportunity for some cultural outreach as well? Uh, definitely about cone snails, a little bit about the Philippines. Uh, Leia, the postdoc who's working on the outreach mostly, uh, she does let me speak a little bit about my pl- hometown and the place. And so a little bit, but mostly mostly the cone snails. But it's always good to get some context into the science yeah. too, right? Because um, there are people, there are locals that are doing this work. And I think those are the other people that don't necessarily make it into the scientific reporting are like the the boat drivers and the divers and everything. Well, I guess the divers are usually somewhat <laughs> involved. Uh, but, you know, there's there's a lot of moving pieces to make science happen. And I think... A project like yours lends itself to talking about that because it's really interesting from like top to bottom, starting with the cone snail, which jabs things with its nose and then eats them, (laughs) to the process of like keeping cone snails cold while flying them from one part of the Philippines to the other. And now there's this cool potential for a biomedical application to this venom. It's like this full circle where every part of it is super interesting And I am so glad that you came here to talk to us about it uh, because you are also super – you are as interesting as the cone snails from which you are doing your work. Uh, And I want to thank you so much for coming on to this podcast. How can we keep up with the work you're doing? How can we follow you and support you? Yep. Uh, you guys can follow me on Twitter. It's Iris Bayara. And then also follow our lab um, at Safavi Lab on Twitter. And also check out our lab website, helenasafavi.com. I think there's more information there about cone snails, more photos of our fieldwork, and information about the outreach activities we do too. Awesome. We will have links to all of that on our website. Bea, thank you so much for talking to us. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much to Bea for talking to me about cone snails. Be sure to check out our website to learn more about her work and the work of other members of the Safavi Lab. You have come to the end of another episode of the Science Night Podcast, but there are lots more good things to come this summer, so be sure to follow us on social media. If you want to follow me, I am on Twitter at James underscore Reed and the number three. So James underscore Reed three. And I'm not even going to be talking about the 76ers anymore. Those That team's dead. It's time to move on. We're watching baseball now. Oh, so, yay. Yeah. <laughs> you're, not, you're not watching hockey, huh? Oh, sorry. I'm not talking about hockey. Sorry. Hockey's not a real thing. I'm sorry. Steffi, 
where can everybody find and follow you? You can find me on Twitter at Steffi Deem or on Instagram at Starshipin. Yeah, and the uh, the editorial board at Wired should go ahead and click that follow button. Just stay up to do- stay up to date for no reason whatsoever. Jason, where can everybody find and follow you? You can find me on Twitter at OrganJM. Wired should also follow Jason, too. He does a lot of great tweets about, like, uh, Jeopardy and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I do like those. Oh, they just me too. randomly show up on my feed. Sometimes they're really funny. Sometimes they're not. I get it. I, they're hit or miss. But um, but I, I always give it the good old college try. You never know. You never you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. This is an outro that we're taking way too long on. Follow the show at Science Night 1 and check out our home on the web at SciNight.com. That is S-C-I-N-I-G-H-T dot com. For past episodes, links to learn more about our guests and the stories we talked about. And most importantly, our new line of Cone Snail themed merch. This is not a drill. It is finally here. So go to Cyanite.com slash merch to buy some 9-inch snail stuff today. We will be back on Wednesday, June 8th with another episode. And until then, have a great night. The Science Night Podcast is a proud member of the River Power Podcast Mill. To find out more about our shows, go to riverpower.xyz.